Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Central Ave. It is so good to be back with more in-depth stories on our season one premiere. I'm Julissa Bermudez. And I'm Sonia Richards-Ross. Thanks for joining us. Now let's get straight to business on a viral video sensation of the worrisome kind, as mostly white, middle-aged women continue to get caught on camera phones, acting out, and ringing false alarms. Keeping up with the Karens is tonight's central story. You call me a So? She called the police on an eight-year-old little girl. If the law didn't say that I couldn't kill the they'd all be dead! For her to make that racial statement was, 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 was a jab. I don't think you live here because I saw you have slanted eyes. I've gotten called worse, but it still doesn't take away sort of the burn. The incident that set off Alex Wong's neighborhood Karen his four and six year old sons quarantining in Southern California were using sidewalk chalk on a shared alleyway. You have had a problem with me since I moved in here. No, we, we saw a guy that didn't have splinted eyes. Well, you calling the cops because I'm black? Is that what it is? No. Okay, why are you calling because the cops? You're in front of my neighbor's house and you need to leave. Isaac Perkins is a census worker who was out in Houston doing his job. It kind of reminds me of uh, when slaves have to show their freedom papers. You know, to explain that, hey, I'm a free slave and I can do what I want out here. Today, the hashtag Karen yields well over 900,000 posts on Instagram, and there are plenty of other iterations of it. Whether on TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube, these self-proclaimed justice vigilantes act with impunity towards anyone they deem deserving. But the fascination with Karens transcends the web. Karen-type portrayals are plentiful, like Reese Witherspoon's character in Hulu's five-time Emmy-nominated Little Fires Everywhere. I would never make this about race. HBO's Lovecraft Country has a 1950s-era Karen. No, you can't just go around killing white women. And who can forget the most classic Karen performance possibly of all time, The Color Purple's infamous Miss Millie playing opposite Oprah Winfrey's Sophia. You children are so clean. Would you like to work for me? Be my maid? I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. On May 25th, eerily, also the day of George Floyd's murder, this video went viral. I'm being threatened by a man in the Rambo. Please send the cops immediately. It's now been watched over 45 million times. Within 24 hours of the video going viral, Amy Cooper was fired from her job as vice president and head of investment solutions at Franklin Templeton, an elite asset management firm. The University of Chicago Business School grad also temporarily lost custody of her dog and has been charged with filing a false police report. Racist Karen strikes a national nerve for a particular reason, and that reason is history. Dr. April Williams, a faculty associate at Harvard University who focuses on race, gender, and community, shares the historical receipts. We can point to the Crossboro boys who were falsely accused. Uh, we can think about Emmett Till, who was not even really accused, didn't have a trial, was lynched because he whistled at a white woman. If we're thinking about Susan Smith, who was actually the murderer in this case and accused a black man of hijacking and kidnapping her children, right? Black men have historically been scapegoated just because white women felt uncomfortable. If we were gonna use a more uh, childish term, we would say that they're tattlers. Jamal Muwakil, a PhD candidate in the Department of Linguistics at UCSB, says that Karen strategically uses buzzwords and phrases like, I feel threatened or I'm being attacked to convey an imminent sense of danger or simply, you don't belong here. So are you outside barbecuing? I don't like it. I'm going to call the police. Hopefully you'll get the message, right? It's a subtle sense of terror. For black women who have seen their husbands, fathers, and sons demonized for centuries, Mickey Kendall, author of Hood Feminism, explains how Karenism is a modern derivative of old-fashioned discrimination and white privilege. You think you should be treated like your grandmother who screamed at Ruby Bridges, and instead you're going to be treated like Amy Cooper or Justine Sacco, where you might lose your job for a while. Doesn't mean your life is ruined forever, but it does mean that you might actually have to be uncomfortable for longer than two minutes. This is life and death 
for black people and people of color, and it has to stop. In July, Shimon Walton, a district supervisor in San Francisco, introduced the Karen Act, which cleverly stands for Caution Against Racially Exploitative Non-Emergencies. People making arbitrary calls could be fined a thousand dollars. I can stop a Karen before they Karen. With a combined 7 million followers on his social media accounts, King Kieran knows a viral tidal wave when he sees one. Every Karen believes that they're an Avenger and that they will sit on this earth to protect everybody. You're not protecting nothing. You're just making people's lives live in hell. Stop. Speaking of Hellraisers, Central Park Karen, a.k.a. Amy Cooper, is scheduled to be arraigned on October 14th. And now, the latest developments in the case that's dominating the court of public opinion. The rally cry for Breonna Taylor. Our Emmy-nominated politics and social justice correspondent, Naima Abduwahi, has been tracking it closely. Brett Hankison committed the offense of wanton endangerment in the first degree. Six bullets struck Ms. Taylor. Only one shot was fatal. The fatal shot was fired by Detective Cosgrove. I mean, if, if I'm baffled, then I understand how the community uh, would be. Moments after Attorney General Daniel Cameron explained that the lethal bullet that killed Brianna was not from the gun of the only officer charged, civil rights attorney Chris Stewart was left confused about why Brett Hankinson was the only officer indicted. If I heard correctly, the charges that he got were not for firing into Brianna Taylor's apartment, it was for the other surrounding people that lived in the complex. Uh, so. This was a Black Lives Don't Matter ruling. Outrage both online and on the streets began right away. The night of the decision, authorities say two officers were shot and wounded. Nearly two days before, in anticipation of the public unrest, a state of emergency was ordered by Mayor Fisher, and police put up barricades restricting a 25-block area around downtown. As a Black female, where might I be if my skin were not black? 17-year Louisville resident and local business leader Tawana Bain has watched the city, an entire country, process Brianna's murder. Why do you think it took so long for her story to gain momentum and the national attention that it deserved? For uh, black women, there has not been as much heightened awareness. And so I think it was um, kind of shocking to some that the national um, media and the uh, celebrity really took an interest. Thanks, Naima. Of course, we will continue to follow the Taylor case. And tune in next week for our very special in-depth investigation on violence against African-American women when Central App presents Say Her Name. We'll be right back. That's convenient. I don't know what you want from me. I want you to stop lying and tell me why Ben is dead. Welcome back to Central Lab. That was Julia Garner as the scene-stealing Ruth Langmore in Netflix critically acclaimed Ozark. Last week, Julia won her second consecutive Emmy for Best Supporting Actress, beating out Meryl Streep and giving the streamer one more reason to brag. Now we examine how all the competition is measuring up in the hard-fought war for subscriber dominance. Strap in! It's just crazy. It's a battle royale out there. It's a battle for subscribers. It's nuts. This war isn't going to win itself. They're basically in a pitched battle for who's going to dominate the future of the entertainment industry for the long term. Things are going to get ugly. Oh, it's already gotten ugly. A 28% jump in network and cable TV viewers in the beginning of the COVID crisis has now all but vanished. But streaming usage has spiked while battling for eyeballs. Now where to begin? Let's start with the OG streaming king. At the beginning of April, when millions were sheltering in place, Netflix scored 16 million new signups, an impressive 10% increase in its worldwide domination of viewership. Point four they lost subscribers. And people were wondering, you know, where does Netflix go from here? And COVID came in and, you know, there they go. Way up, 16 million subscribers almost immediately just signed up that month. They're creating a lot of original content from 
people like Shonda Rhimes, Ryan Murphy. And they've even signed up the former President Obama, Michelle Obama, and Meghan Markle, and Prince Harry. Soon after COVID sent us inside, Amazon also saw an increase. There's a 35% uptick in new viewers. And Hulu, they've even picked up 7 million subscribers. We're just getting started. But the new streamers aggressively armed up, hiring big stars with big budgets. We can do this. In the case of Apple Plus, the draw is these expensive new series. It has no library of content. It launched with eight original series, the most high profile of which is Jennifer Aniston's return to TV in the morning show. The problem is season two of the news drama, as well as the return of Jason Momoa in his action series C, are delayed due to the pandemic. So while Apple subscribers wait, Mariah Carey will add some holiday cheer with an all new Christmas special. My father cannot fight. So I will take his place. Disney's a big company, but they took a major hit. Uh, all their amusement parks had to shut down. Movies had to shut down. But thank goodness, on their part, Disney Plus came along at just the right time and saved them. They picked up 50 million subscribers really quickly. It's the power of the Disney brand. And The Mandalorian was one of their biggest early hits. They're going to be back for season two, October 30th. Good. NBC Universal's Peacock is less well known than perhaps these other services. They have, however, obtained exclusive streaming access to popular old shows, such as The Office. NBC outbid Netflix for the rights of the classic comedy for a reported 500 million for five years, beginning in 2021. The new platform does have a free option and announced over 15 million signups in just seven weeks. Then there's HBO Max. Thanks to COVID, their much publicized Friends cast reunion never happened. Yeah, I think HBO's in it for the long haul. It's a marathon, not a sprint for them. So the fact they didn't get the Friends reunion is not the end of the world. They'll get it eventually. You're in a bad spot. Came up here to try and help you with that. Lawrence, you just put Quibi on the map. Congratulations on your Emmy. I'm just incredibly honored that um, I've been recognized for the work I've done in this way. And I think for Quibi, it's a nice boost for them. But will Lawrence Fishburne's third Emmy win, this time for Quibi's Free Ray Sean, be the boost the struggling platform needs? The brainchild of media proprietor Jeffrey Katzenberg was promoted as the new way to be entertained with short bite-sized shows. Just six months after launching, brutal headlines persist. As the Wall Street Journal reports, the platform may soon be offered up for sale. Lawrence puts some of the blame on the COVID crisis. I think COVID has slowed down the response to it. But at the same time, I also think they've got a lot of content. You know, they got a mandate to try and do things differently. And, and, and hopefully it's, it's working for them. Whoop, there it is. But when it comes to comedy, pop TV couldn't be beat. Shit's Creek completely swept the category at last week's Emmy. And we'll be back with an inside analysis of Kanye's unconventional campaign. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Welcome back. That was Kanye West speaking his truth at NBC's Hurricane Katrina Relief Concert exactly 15 years ago this month. It's known as the first time West went rogue on national TV, but it would not be the last. Now, our political correspondent, Naima Abdullahi, is back as she went inside his play for the presidency to find out if Ye is putting his money where his mouth is. It hit me to, uh, to run for president uh, in 2015. And then also when I came up with the name of my party, the birthday party, it, it was funny to me. It was yeah, just crazy. It was crazy. Five years after it dawned on Kanye to run for president, he made it official in a July 4th tweet. And yes, he is running, or walking as he stated, under the birthday party. What do you make of Kanye West's campaign? I'm not exactly sure what he wants to do for the American people. Oftentimes when he talks about running for the presidency, it's about him and how he feels. Kanye's running mate. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Michelle Tidball, a self-described biblical life coach from Kanye's new home base of Cody, Wyoming, who has yet to comment publicly on joining the ticket. The entire thing seems unusual, but she doesn't particularly add much to the ticket. From the start, Kanye's campaign has been a series of missteps. A sparsely attended rally on July 20th in Charleston, South Carolina, failed to gather enough signatures to get him on the state ballot. 
organization of Kanye's one campaign event was Shambhala, and it ended up being this very bizarre stream of consciousness one hour monologue. <laughs> Kanye, who had 2020 shaved onto his head and cried when speaking about almost aborting his oldest daughter, North, now seven, lost the crowd with this. Well, Harriet Tubman never actually freed the slaves. She just had the slaves go work for other white people. Y'all, we leaving right now. Traditionally, most presidential campaigns don't start by uh, attacking beloved historical figures. Kanye's platform, as posted on his campaign website along with biblical verses, includes bringing prayer back to schools and restoring the economy with no specifics. When he's thinking largely about international issues, uh, domestic policies, uh, there's really no foundation there. This seems to be a vanity play, and it seems to be the idea that he's a celebrity and he's famous enough that if he just gets his name on the ballot, people will somehow vote for him. Kanye's confidence aside, and despite being a billionaire and having over 30 million active Twitter followers, he doesn't stand a chance being on the ballot in only 10 states, a result of his hastily assembled team missing several state filing deadlines. How many signatures did you collect? In politically critical Wisconsin, Lane Rulin, a lawyer who once worked for the Trump campaign, missed the 5 p.m. filing deadline by only 14 seconds. So much of the issues are that you can't start running for president a couple months out after some things have filing deadlines and then try to try to figure things out as you know as you're going along as it gets closer and closer and closer to election day and then there's kanye's much publicized struggles with bipolar disorder sadly kanye's recent twitter tirades may call into question his mental stability in a series of tweets he recently compared himself to moses posted a video of himself urinating on one of his 21 grammys and tweeted to his daughter north suggesting he might be murdered given his recent Recent Twitter tirades, do you think Kanye West is taking this campaign seriously? I don't think it can be understated that we're witnessing a man have a series of mental breakdowns uh, on a, con a pretty consistent basis. And we have to ask ourselves, um, for someone who's been so open and honest about the mental health challenges that he is currently experiencing, why he would want the pressures of, of being in the role of an executive of any capacity. The question then comes down to not if Kanye will win the presidency, but if he could impact the general election, as some have questioned. Kanye's been outspoken in the past about his support for Donald Trump. There was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. With many allies of the president working on Kanye's ground campaign, like Greg Keller of the Atlas Strategy Group, some Democrats are concerned it's all a ploy to lure voters from Biden, which Kanye denied on Nick Cannon's podcast. They saying that they paying you to, to do what you're doing to be a distraction. Bro, can't nobody pay me. <laughs> you got more money than Trump. I got more money than Trump. <laughs> Kanye is polling at only 2% among black voters. Not a lot, but by being on the ballot in just a couple of tightly contested swing states like Minnesota and Iowa, Kanye could be a presidential player after all. There seems to be the calculation there that by having Kanye West on the ballot to attract African-American voters who traditionally support Democrats, that reduction, that, that spoiler effect by Kanye might be enough to somehow put Donald Trump over the top. Now there is much debate about the 2020 election polls and their accuracy, but when it comes to voter turnout, it's basically a consensus among political forecasters with all experts projecting that it will be a record-breaking turnout, possibly the highest in over a hundred years. Hey, welcome back. There's never enough time for us to share everything our investigations uncover, but you can always get more. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel at Central Ave TV. And for more commentary, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But coming up in our next half hour, we've got why Kim Kardashian is now taking on murder cases, plus the digital dating phenomenon that only COVID could create. See you in a flash. <laughs>